And we are back. This is Women in Tech Sweden, and thank you so much for being here. It's the afternoon, and boy, do we have a program for you. This afternoon is, oh, I can't, I can't even, this is too good. So thank you for being here, and uh, just let's just kickstart this afternoon by watching this. Being polite is not the same thing as being quiet. I think among women and, and girls that, you know, sometimes there's a sense that no matter what they do, that their work will not be recognized the way it would be if they were a man. And I think you said that has been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. I cannot see a world filled with kindness without science and technology being involved. But don't be afraid of a path. Take it. <laughs> when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Do something, right? Even if you don't know what it is and where it will lead you, do it. My gosh, we are about to experience the true benefit of having a fully digital event. Our next speaker is not in Stockholm. She is on the other side of the world, and she is Time's Kid of the Year. That's a like person of the year, but younger, and I will say awesomer. She is an inventor who has made, like, truly brilliant stuff, and in widely different fields. She has done anti-bullying software, a device that detects lead in water, and a medical device that detects opioid addiction. Oh wait, and she's mentored 38,000 youths over the past two years. Did I mention that she is 15 years old? 15 years old! Yes, that is her, sorry for, talking about age, but this, she is just fantastic. And she loves baking and fencing and playing the piano. And take a look at this. I'm a very curious person, if that's one thing you need to know about me. I love learning about the environment, ecology. Everything is just of such interest to me. I just like learning in general. So everything in school is actually super fun. I cannot see a world filled with kindness without science and technology being involved. My inspiration behind it was actually the Flint water crisis. It was just so unacceptable that kids my age were essentially drinking a poison every day. And I realized that something really needed to be done to help solve that problem. I don't think I can say there was like an aha moment where I was like, this is what I want to do. It was rather just like this continuous, like learning and loving more about STEM and science and technology. But I can tell you a huge changing moment in my life was about I want to say when I was four or five years old, my uncle got me a chemistry kit and I felt the need to finish the whole thing in one day and I did. A lot of my devices are based on biology, chemistry, physics, computational methods. This process, it's usually spread over a couple of months, even years. It's just based on how I feel about it and how I get inspired by something. I don't force myself through the process. I don't do anything to accelerate it. I do it at a pace which makes me feel excited and makes me want to keep going. So See, that's the biggest thing about innovation is if you don't have that motivation and drive to keep going, it's going to be dry. It's not going to be something you enjoy doing or anybody else is going to enjoy hearing about. All right, we have, uh, I think we have images coming in. Hi, oh, look at you. This makes me so happy to see you all. And I've seen a whole bunch of kids watching. I saw somebody's baby that tagged me on Twitter. I'm underbar if you want to tag me, that's okay. Um, yeah, people are, oh, I see, oh, I see some familiar faces. That's Lotta, Zweis, Ingenieurer. Oh, I see the pa, oh. Oh, you guys, oh, that's Mayam. Nice. I love that people are tuning in from all of Sweden. It's uh, oh, so good. 
Nice, nice, nice. Boden. Whoa, that's okay. So what have we done today? We've like we're not wrapping up. We're just like one speaker into our afternoon session. But I can't help but stop and think about like what an amazing day we're having. Uh, like. There's so many breakout sessions that have been happening, these focus sessions, and, and your engagement has been fabulous. Uh, and I'm so happy to hear that people have met new colleagues and um, stuff's really been going on. Now, moving forward, we have another heavy hitter lined up for you today. She is the co-founder um, and CEO, CEO of Ado. Ado? Mm, we'll ask her how we pronounce it. And she, so she's the boss of an artificial intelligence company. I love saying that she is the boss. And she's also on the board that helps Singapore uh, with how they implement like smart city technology. And I cannot believe that she is here with us today. It's Dr. Aisha Kama. Can you hear me? I can. Hello. Hi. Well, <laughs> welcome to Sweden, even though you're not in Sweden. Where are you? I'm in Singapore, <sighs> but in spirit, I'm with you guys. I feel it. I feel it. What is it like in Singapore today? It's actually the same weather every single day. It's hot and balmy, so uh, not bad at all. I love Singapore. I can't wait until the world opens up and we get to, I can go there again. Um, so smart cities, is, is that a thing now? It is very much a thing. And you know, I've been studying it for over a decade before it was sexy or people were talking about it. But now more than ever, especially after the pandemic, we see there's an acceleration of digitization of city infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of deep tech like AI, VR, IoT is gonna be used about it. And I'm excited to kind of think about that with you guys today. I love it. I want to hear more and I want to hear it now. Please take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. What I'm going to be talking about is how deep tech will transform how we live. Now, one thing that we have to acknowledge is that almost all of us will reside in cities and the defining force of how we live and work in those cities will be data. Now, did you know that five people join the middle class in the world every single second? And most of this growth is happening in Asia. Now, why do people move to cities? They really move to have access to better healthcare, better education, better security, culture, art, ecosystems. Yet, one of the things that we discovered in the pandemic was that we couldn't really have this. Even though we were in cities, we were in lockdown. And according to Bill Gates and other uh, experts, we're gonna have problems like this, crises that we have to deal with. And so the traditional form of the city isn't really gonna work anymore. Enter the concept of the 15 minute city. And the idea of this, which is, is an emergent concept in cities is that everything should be 15 minutes from where you live. From the mall, to the doctor, to the school, to your sports and gym. And this means that cities have to be reconfigured and hyper-local so that they can actually meet all the requirements that anybody would have. Now, while Paris is thinking about this as the concept came from a philosopher there, we can see in China, uh, they're already working on this concept. There's going to be a new city built from scratch that's called a COVID proof city. And it's really designed to be resilient to crises and to be a lot like the 15 minute city. So what does that look like? 
Well, let's look at these four options. If you look at the top left, you can see that it's made of sustainable materials. It's very green. There's not a lot of um, traffic, probably autonomous vehicles, some of them. And then most of the people are actually using bicycles. If you look at the top right, you can see that it's a home, but people are working. So it's also a co-working space. And if you look at the bottom right, uh, you can see that they're growing their own food. And this is, you can go and pick up your vegetables and anything else you might need in the neighborhood, uh, which is just a few blocks away instead of growing to a grocery store. And then finally on the bottom left, you have this idea that no matter what happens, you can easily 3D print anything that malfunctions in your house. So it's a kind of a maker space. Now, this is the future city, cities that will be built from scratch. But what about existing cities? Well, all of our high rises and buildings and the most dynamic cosmopolitan cities will have to become multifunctional. And that means they'll need to use deep tech like AI, VR, and robotics. In Tokyo, buildings are getting a post-pandemic makeover. They're going to be retrofitted like these three skyscrapers for safety, multi-use, and sustainability. And what that means is, for example, that moving through such buildings will be completely contactless using artificial intelligence for facial recognition, uh, security identification, voice recognition, you will be able to move through the building. It will have antibacterial, microbial bacterial coating on all the surfaces. Moving in and out of the building, you will be using your voice to speak to the building. And that will become the way that we interact not with this cement blocks that we consider a building, but this live personality of a building almost that will know us and will allow us to be safe and secure. The building itself will change as well. How many of us have experienced that e-commerce has become a booming factor and a very necessary factor in our lives? That's not going to go away. We all live and have beautiful terraces and apartments, but there'll be a special terrace that's designed for drone deliveries. And this is a mock-up from one of the designers on how using artificial intelligence and robotics, these drones will constantly be coming and delivering goods and services to us in our homes. Not only will that happen, but inside the home, uh, you know, this idea of always being on Zoom and Zoom fatigue, uh, which is really causing a lot of uh, stress to people, will be replaced by virtual reality and social presence that feels a lot more real. If you've ever put on VR headsets, you will feel that everybody's in this cartoon-like space. But now, Organizations like Facebook are working on making our avatars that much more real. So you can see this man and woman are in their homes, but their avatars are precisely like their faces and their expressions are the same. And because of the sound projections, they can really feel different people in the room as they're sitting. Um, the sound is coming from that side. And over time, if you were haptic sensors in your gloves, you could even shake someone's hand. Now, this is the road to all spaces becoming multifunctional. And what this means is that your home, your office, your school, your philharmonic orchestra, everything is dynamic because there's a layer of digital on top of any physical space. And that's really the definition of a, a smart city. It's when you put a layer of digital that is helping personalize that space for you. 
One of the things that's becoming very popular, I'm sure you know about Peloton, the bike that everyone seems to be using, are new kinds of AI-based gyms like Tonal. So you can see that Tonal is just like a mirror on your wall. And um, it has these weights, but the weights are digitally controlled. So as you do better, just like a real trainer would push you in the gym, uh, the tonal is pushing you in the gym and with computer vision uh, and more sophisticated computer vision over time, it is going to be correcting your form and it is also checking your heartbeat and so that it makes sure you're above a certain cardio level. So for those of us who are gym rats or really need that extra attention, you know, you can just very neatly convert one part of your home into a gym. And that's very much reliant on this sense of sensors and data and IoT and computer vision. But, you know, there are other things that matter as well. I talked about food. In Singapore, you know, we import almost all of our food. In fact, most people will be living in cities, about 10 billion by 2050, and 80% of all food will be consumed in cities. Yet places like Singapore have a supply chain issue. So now we're gonna grow the food on our buildings. And so our buildings will be multifunctional outside as well. This is an example of the kinds of investments that Singapore will be making so that 30% of our food by 2030 is grown within the city. And the building can be multifunctional beyond just generating food for us. It can literally clean the air. This is a, uh, a kind of prototype that was made as part of a competition, it, it would be a carbon filtering tower that would be rise up as the largest building in New York City. And it would be filtering, it would be made of materials that are constantly filtering uh, carbon dioxide and any other kinds of emissions. So this is what I mean by thinking about all the different technologies that can make life qualitatively better can make it more efficient for all of us to have access to what we need within 15 minutes. Now, how can we make this happen? And here's the key. When the smart city idea first came out uh, 10 years ago, I was in New York City. There were these big companies and they were talking about the fact that there'll be one mega company that would be the operating system of the city. That's not the way it panned out. In fact, the good news for all of us is that not only will we potentially benefit from the smart city, we can be part of the players that contribute to it. For example, one of the things that will really drive this is 5G. Now 5G, if you think about it, why is it so important for smart cities? Well, you know, before it used to take, believe it or not, 26 hours to download a two hour film. Now you probably take about six minutes, but with 5G, it will take one, two, three, almost four seconds. That's it. That means now you are capable of sending that much more information like video, like sound, like all the data from different sensors to a company that can actually help you make your life easier in a city. Let me give you an example. On the left is a nurse. And this is by the way, um, by British Telecom, it's a 5G prototype that they're building. And on the left is a nurse, he's treating um, a victim that is actually a mannequin. But that nurse is not an expert. The expert doctor is hundreds of miles away or even 20, 30 miles away, definitely more than 15 minutes away. To save that individual's life, 5G allows video cameras to real time take precise information from within that ambulance 
or a nearby hyperlocal clinic to the doctor who's sitting in the hospital uh, on the right and the gloves of the nurse is wearing and touching the patient, that is also sending information to the doctor. So you can imagine how crisis management, healthcare management um, can become so much better. And in this, you have many different ecosystem players. You have the hardware providers of the gloves, you have the VR set, you have the healthcare platform. It's an ecosystem of players, all of them doing their own part to be able to contribute to the smart city. And that is really the beauty of it. Once you have the hardware and a digital platform, what we call, um, the, it could be on the cloud, or it could be an intelligent data platform that you build. Now, anybody can start adding use cases. You can take that data and start adding, um, you know, smart parking, predictive maintenance, resource optimization, security. But the reason we make everything happen in a city is to give residents experiences that are high quality, safe, and sustainable. Now, I've spoken a lot about all the good things that come from it. But the last thing I want to talk about for the next two or three minutes is technology, any technology, including artificial intelligence, virtual reality, quantum computing, is a double-edged sword. If you're gonna use data, you can use it for good, or you can use it to manipulate people, to harm people. And it's very important if all of you are going to be working on data and AI or any service that uses these technologies, that you make sure it's done in a transparent and secure manner, that the data is kept private, that it's being used in an ethical manner, that is compliant with the regulations of the country that you're in, and that there is an ethical element to it. You know, in Singapore, we actually have a certification for product managers. Product managers are the people who envision what a product will look like that is specifically on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And that's very, very important. Everyone should have a say in it. Everyone should be able to opt in to the use of technologies that are supposed to benefit you. And it's very necessary that people like you and me take ownership of that. You should never trust a machine. You should never only trust an individual who is an expert, but you should use your own instinct, your own judgment, your own agency as an individual, as a citizen to demand the best service but also to demand that it's done in a responsible manner. And I think that's what's so exciting, the opportunity to solve so many problems and yet to do it in a way that we can all be proud of. Well, I've been really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today about what I love about AI and deep tech and smart cities, but what I really believe in, which is, in doing it in a manner that's ethical and responsible. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I like as a user experience and interaction designer, I am super stoked about what you are talking about, like creating uh, like how smart homes is not just science fiction. -y, it's like making your space magical and, and work for you. What type of space do you envision for yourself? What kind of magic do you want to bring into your own home? Oh, in my own home, honestly, I love my, I'm, I'm very geeky, very techy, but then I have a side to me. I love meditation. I love yoga. So I have a little space, but I would love to turn it into the park that I love and have the sound and smell of it and, and have a more immersive experience with my fellow um, yogis. So I think for me, that's very important. And I think it's very possible but all of the, the cameras and everything that we put in a space 
you know, I, I'm very concerned, especially because I have children as well, that, uh, that, that that information should not be used or sold or kept in any insecure way. Absolutely. Uh, what, why do you think it is that so many people have like a negative uh, perspective on smart technology and, and where does that come from? You know, it comes from a very good place, which is called critical thinking. Ah. So I think it's totally fine. The problem is when we get extreme, we either love it or we are so suspicious of it. Mm. But the boring truth is we should just be balanced. And the word for it is governance. You want the government and the companies that you work with to have data governance. And that's a lot of what I work on as well with the World Economic Forum and uh, with different parts of the government in Singapore. I think that you should question things, but you should not have an extreme reaction. You should consult people and see what the best way forward is. Your work with the World Economic Forum is quite fascinating. Can you tell us more about what it is you do there? So I am on one of the um, future global councils. And what we are looking at is especially for media and uh, later on now I'm working on uh, data policies. You know, how do you des design policies or how do you design systems that can be trusted by people? And if there are any issues, what is their recourse? Right, so, the, so in Europe, you have this uh, GDPR. Mm. So for example, you could say, I applied for health insurance and I was refused. And that is, and then the insurance company says, well, the AI made that decision. Yeah. And um, then you have to have a recourse. So these are all things that people are thinking about because there's so much benefit from these technologies. You don't want to just close the door on them. You just want to make sure that individuals have agency and recourse in case they disagree mm. or find it unjust. Well said. I can't wait to hear more from you when we do our Q&A in a few minutes. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Well, our next speaker is also a doctor. We um, but first, let's take a look at this. My name is Greta Thunberg, and I want you to panic. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shame? You have a brilliant mind, clearly. You are very, very generous uh, with that mind and information. And, and I, I do think that I was born a, a, under a very bright star. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. There is have so much amazing things have been happening this past year, and it's easy to forget when you are uh, stuck at home in a global pandemic. So we just wanted to put together a few of the moments that have been really special this past year. And now to our final, final speaker of the day. She is a doctor, but not only, like, not like a medical doctor, like the, I've, yeah, you know, the other kind of doctor. And she is a CEO and co-founder of a company I find super cool. It's called Affectiva, and they are on a quest to make feelings understandable for our technology. But not only has she started a company and, and is running that, she also wrote this book. And this is the book that you can win if you submit your questions in the chat. We are giving away 200 copies. So keep submitting questions. We are going to do a Q&A after this. So, uh, well, this, this book is called Girl Decoded, and it's a scientist's quest to reclaim our humanity by bringing emotional intelligence into technology. I need to hear more about what this book is about. And the author is with us now, Dr. Rana El Kayoubi. Hi. Hi, thank you for having me and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Welcome to Women in Tech Sweden. Where are you? 
I am in Boston, but I have to say on my bucket list is to visit the ABBA Museum. So I'm so bummed that I'm not there in person. You have to invite me back next year. When okay, I promise we will. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Rana, please take it away and tell us more about what it is that you do. Great. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody, uh, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, happy uh, Women's History Month. I love the theme of this event, the power of resilience. We, of course, all of us over the past year have had to exercise the superpower and um, I don't know about you, but the amount of innovation and the, uh, the amount of resilience that people have shown over the past year, I find that super inspiring. Um, so excited to share with you a little bit of my story and the work we do um, and uh, share some, some, yeah, some anecdotes on how I found resilience um, in, in my career. So I'm on a mission to humanize technology. I started on this journey over 20 years ago when I moved from Cairo to Cambridge University to pursue my doctorate degree in computer science. So um, I grew up in Cairo, Egypt, and around the Middle East. My two parents are technologists, so I I grew up kind of realizing the power of technology and how technology can really help connect uh, people together. And that's been a common thread throughout my career. So I studied computer science as an undergraduate, was really drawn to human machine interfaces and human machine interaction, that touch point, that friction between human and machines. And I kind of projected that it was going to really dramatically change uh, over the course of my life. And I wanted to play a part in shaping how these technologies looked and how they brought people together. So um, after my undergraduate, I had the opportunity to go to Cambridge University to do my doctorate degree. And my PhD work was all about building that very first emotionally intelligent machine. So I'm a computer scientist by background. So I had to figure out like the psychology world, like how do people really connect and communicate? Well, guess what? Only 10% of how we communicate is in the actual choice of words we use. 90% is nonverbal. And it's split equally between your facial expressions, I do a lot of those, um, your hand gestures, your body posture, and your vocal intonation. How fast are you speaking? How much energy is in your voice? Are you monotonous and boring or are you energetic? All of these nonverbal signals constitute the majority of way that we communicate as humans. 20 years ago, when I first got to Cambridge, um, I had this aha moment. I, I was, it was my first experience being away from my family back home in Egypt. And I realized I was spending more time in front of my computer than I did interacting with any other human being. Yet this device had absolutely no clue I was, how I was feeling. It was completely oblivious to my emotional and mental state. But even worse, I realized it was the main portal of communication I had with my family back home. Um, and I realized that oftentimes um, the nuanced, rich nonverbal communication was just lost in cyberspace. And the best I could really do was send a little emoji uh, to my family. And, you know, this past year has, <clears throat> sorry, this past year has really reminded me of that time back in Cambridge, because of course, we're now all socially distanced, we can't see each other, and we're resorting to our digital technologies and platforms to connect and communicate. And I can't help but feel that I'm kind of been teleported back to Cambridge where I feel like technology is, of course, connecting us. Um, and that's, you know, I'm grateful for that. But the quality of the connection, it's still missing the richness of this nonverbal communication. And I'll give you a case in point. If I were with you all in Stockholm, we would be in some amazing big auditorium and I would be able to riff off of the energy of you all, right? I would be able to sense if what I'm saying is engaging or not. If I, if I say a joke, do you all laugh or not? Um, hopefully you're not all sitting at home, like rolling your eyes. Hopefully you're engaging and you're interested in what I'm saying, but it's so hard for me as a presenter to get a sense of that when we are communicating and connecting um, remotely and, 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 and kind of using technology. Um, I, I think of the platforms that we're using today as V1. And I do believe what the last year has shown us is that there's so much opportunity to build emotionally intelligent technology into our devices. So what does emotion AI or emotionally intelligent technology look like? Well, 
Um, I've been on this mission to capture specifically facial expressions, but we've also looked at vocal intonations using sensors that are readily available and machine learning and computer vision and deep learning and gobs and gobs and gobs of data. <clears throat> so just to simplify it, um, we use camera sensors to, for example, detect if a person is smiling or if they're falling asleep at the driving wheel while, you know, in a car, or if they're frustrated because they're interacting with Alexa and Alexa keeps getting it wrong, right? Like we're able to capture all of these signals and kind of reimagine what a human machine interface could look like. The applications are incredible. Everything from autism, which is what I first explored right after Cambridge, I joined MIT as a postdoc at the Media Lab, uh, which was really a, a playground for innovation. And um, the very first application of the technology was to help autistic kids read and understand these nonverbal signals. So we developed a device. This was way back in 2006. So before Google Glass existed, but it kind of looked like Google Glass. It was a pair of glasses with a little camera on the side. And in real time, it would give um, feedback on what the expression or um, yeah, what, what kind of expressions or emotions um, the people you were interacting with had. And it, it helped these kids understand in real time um, these emotions. And I know one of the organizers of, of this conference, Paulina, um, she and I overlapped at MIT and we, we kind of collaborated on this project to make sure we bring this to the kids in a way that they find engaging and of course meaningful. So we, so we did that, but while at MIT, twice a year, we would host all of these companies and they quickly expressed interest in commercializing the technology. And so that was the tipping point for me moving from academia <clears throat> to becoming an entrepreneur and starting Affectiva in 2009 with my co-founder, Professor Rosalind Picard. We are on a mission to humanize technology. There's so many applications. We primarily focus on two markets. One is the automotive industry. So bringing our technology to cars so that we are in the short term able to measure things like driver distraction, driver drowsiness, fatigue, frustration, and have the car respond in real time to ensure that our roads are safer. Um, but we've also explored areas and markets um, like, for example, media analytics, where we're able to capture in real time people's emotional response to content. We are, of course, you know, over the last year, have been spending many, many time in front of our machines, engaging with Netflix and all sorts of content. Well, we're able to capture these nuanced responses. Are you like, do you perk up when, you know, at a, per, at a particular section of an ad or a movie? Um, do you get sentimental? Do you resonate with the content? Does it inspire you? Does it inspire you? So all of all of these like important emotions that actually predict consumer behavior, we're able to track these. But the sky is the limit. There are applications around mental health, um, uh, social robotics, Internet of Things, you name it. Um, where resilience comes to play is, you know, a, a number of kind of stories that I want to share with you. When we first spun out of MIT, Ross Picard, my co-founder and I went out to raise capital from the investment community. And unfortunately, we may have met with like 20 or 30 investors and they were all older white men. And here we were, two women coming out of academia, pitching an emotion company. In fact, we used, we would avoid the word emotion. We called it the E word because we knew that it was so different from what these investors were looking for. We looked so different from what they were always pitched. Um, but we persevered. And this is where resilience comes in. And in fact, our very first check that we got was from the Peter, uh, Peter Wallenberg family of Sweden. So um, we do have Swedish investors on our board, and we've been really grateful. And I would say you persevere, you find somebody who shares your core values and your mission. Um, it may not be easy, but you will get there. I will also talk about the ethical um, development and deployment of technology, which is something that is super important to me as a steward and an innovator of this new field a new category of AI. I feel strongly that it's incumbent on us and you all, because you're all thought leaders in your own domains to do this right and to raise the bar for how do we bring AI to society in a way um, 
that ensures that it's not going to be biased against, um, you know, people of color or, or women or, you know, I'm sure you've seen that facial recognition technologies have been criticized because they've been trained on a very non-diverse data set and now they don't work on people that look like me. And that's a problem, especially as we deploy these AI systems at scale. So bias is one consideration, but also like the morality and the ethics of deploying it, consenting people, making sure that people really understand that they're being tracked and how this data is gonna get used. Um, so we, for example, as a company do not work in the security and surveillance space at all. We've, uh, we've made that decision, you know, 11 years ago and we spun out and we've stuck to it and we've turned down millions and millions of dollars of potential funding, but I, I know it's the right thing to do because it's aligned with our core values. And you know, I, I try to evangelize and have other companies in our space take the same set of core values. So I encourage you to think of your stakeholders, not just as your customers or your investors, but society at large. I think we have a responsibility to do that. Um, the final story is about voice of doubt. When I first started the company, I was the chief technology officer. In 2013, our CEO left and, and I had the opportunity to step in and be the CEO. But I kid you not, I had this voice in my head that kept saying, oh no, no, don't do it. You're gonna fail. You are gonna fail. The company's gonna fail. You've never been CEO before. Now our head of sales who had also never been CEO before, he said, you know, I'll take the job. I'll be the CEO. And he became the CEO. Um, fast forward two years to 2015, um, I Googled what are the jobs, roles and responsibilities of a CEO. And I realized I was already doing the job and I had to, I had to shift my mindset. I had to believe in myself first. And once I was able to do that, I took that to the board. It was a unanimous vote. I stepped into the CEO role and that story was four years ago now, five actually coming up to five years ago. Um, so my advice to you is have confidence in yourself. Don't let your own self be the biggest obstacle in your way and, and have resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel all boosted and happy now. Uh, we are going to move you over to the couch uh, for a joint uh, Q&A. So uh, I, think, uh, I think my people are, are on that. But thank you for a great, great talk. I mean, this... Uh, this is such a celebration of fantastic women, and I cannot wait to get to ask all of your questions to the panel. Um, almost ready, almost, oh, there we are, hi! Welcome to this joint Q&A. We have received dozens of questions, and we have few minutes, but uh, how are you all, uh, can you, Please continue talking about resilience. Uh, what does that mean to you? You were talking about it, Donna, but... Uh, do you want me to continue a little bit on that theme? Go for it. All right. I, I think resilience is, is acknowledging that things will change, that you won't always have the answers to the... To, you know, you'll have to make decisions under a lot of uncertainty. We've all seen that in the past year. But to me, it means there's an opportunity to be innovative and creative, like have an innovation mindset and, and have faith that in, 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 in these times of uncertainty and these very challenging times, we have an opportunity to find a new path forward. My favorite, one of my favorite books is um, Ryan um, Holiday's book, uh, The Obstacle is the Way. And he basically kicks off the book saying, imagine you have this rock in front of you. There's no path forward. Well, you can maybe go, um, you know, go on top of it or around it or like find a path through. And, and I really believe that obstacles are put in our way so that we, we, we hustle and we find, uh, find a way forward. Please continue. Uh. I just want to say I'm having such a fangirl moment. I'm, I love, Rana, I love your book and Gitanjali. I love what you've done. So I am in seventh heaven in this company. <laughs> and uh, I'm so, I just wanted to say that. I'm so excited all day about this. Um, look, for me, resilience is, um, and I, I meet a lot of women, whether they're in tech or not in tech. And I have a charity and we teach girls AI and coding. 
I think you resilience. Have to speak, by the way, you have to connect. So you'll have to connect like. Yes, totally awesome. Um, so for me, resilience is upskilling yourself. It's working hard. And that, Rana, that's a lot of what you talk about in your book as well. Um, and I think that, you know, you, you face challenges, but it's not just emotional strength. You need to be somebody who has worked at learning the skills that give you the confidence. Mm. So we talk a lot about mentorship. And I always say I can't hug someone to like success. You know, your confidence comes from inside. And for all the girls listening today, I think if you could just take a little bit of time and learn a little bit, it's really fun. It's exciting. You will feel that much more creative confidence. And that is indispensable. Mm. Gitanelli, you are a master at sharing your work and in inspiring others. How do you get people to like keep going and, and, and col collaborate? Absolutely. That's a great question. And I think there's a lot of layers to it. But the biggest thing that I like to say is that innovation needs to come from within. It needs to be your own drive, your own passion, your own motivation. And that's the reason that I'm at the place that I am today. I like to say that I'm a kid doing what she loves to do. And that's the reason that it makes me me. That's what makes me an innovator. My higher purpose is to make an impact on the world. And I just chose to do that through the means of science and technology. So that's how I really motivate others to do the same is find that inner innovator within themselves, right? Use their passion for helping the world and, you know, innovate for the better because that's that's what we see out there, especially for girls, right? We've been taught that innovation or even science in general is one way, right? It always involves, you know, coding or robotics or something so straightforward, but we've never really looked at science in the ways of community service and helping the world around us. And that's that shift I'm trying to make. And that's that shift that I'm seeing more people start to get interested in as well. But I see that even in, in your talk, uh, Aisha, that, um, how we can use technology to take care of the world, to uh, tackle the climate crisis, get rid of CO2. Uh, but can, but both of you have been involved with the World Economic Forum. Do we need to like collaborate more on uh, like getting, solving the big problems or how do we get those done? I mean, we do. And I think, you know, what I really love about uh, is this this intolerance and this activism that's coming into everybody's mindset now? Uh, you know, you you had sexism, racism, ageism, but now we want to get rid of all that, and we want people to come on the basis of their meritocracy. Mm. And that meritocracy is not just math and engineering, but as Gitanjali said, is anything you are passionate about and good at. And that is the killer combination. Um, and I think that is something I love in tech because my team is all over the world and it doesn't matter whether they come in their daddy's BMW or they come on a bicycle, it's what they bring to the table. And they're awesome out of the box thinkers. And I love that. That is the world that I wanna live in. And that is the kind of people I wanna collaborate with. I want to build on Aisha's point because I think that's really important. Um, we need to bring diverse voices and perspectives around the, the table, and we need to partner with organizations like the World Economic Forum. We're part of the Partnership on AI, AI Consortium, where we have you know all the tech giants and startups, etc. But we also partner with ACLU and Amnesty International to bring a very different perspective to the table. I also love partnering with young people because they, again, they bring such creative thinking and a, and a different point of view on how we should do this. So it's just more diverse voices. We need to really ensure that we're doing that. I have a question from uh, an audience member. Most of my questions are really. Uh, all this high tech stuff is great, but isn't, the re isn't this replacing jobs for many sectors? How do you guys react to that? I can go very quickly. Uh, I, it, it is replacing some jobs, but it's creating so many more super awesome jobs. And so, you know, don't, 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 you know, be in the space, be in the networks where you are connected to these new job opportunities because they're exciting and they are the future. Mm. And there's many, many of them. 
I can add to that as well a little bit. And I, I know that it's definitely not my place to say too much, especially because I'm 15 and I'm in high school. You are so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, I feel like if we were to look into – you know, this world of going forward, right? It's that same thing. If you think about it in the terms of artificial intelligence, right? I talk technologically, so that's the example I'm going to use. But in the terms of artificial intelligence, everyone was scared, still scared that it was going to take over the world, right? And I think that those are based on the choices that we make. Those are based on the choices we make going forward. And just like, you know, everyone's been saying as well, it, it's in jobs will be leaving, but more jobs will be coming in, right? We haven't met our full potential for innovation in the world. We haven't met our full potential for job opportunities in the world. I think the world will be opened up more. So it's just, it's, it's just staying in touch, staying um, active on whatever platform and just making sure that, you know, others are aware of your work and what you're doing going forward. I could not have said it, but that was so such a great closing for our joint session. Thank you all. I, I hope everyone continues reaching out to you online after this because I want to keep, you need to keep talking to the world. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation in uh, Women in Tech Sweden.